Hello, book lovers, and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins, and today I'm talking to author Annette Swan. Annette is the author of Burnt Face, Scarred for Life. Growing up in Melbourne, Australia, Annette tells us the struggle of surviving severe third-degree burn injuries at the tender age of nine as a result of one irresponsible adult's actions at a Christmas barbecue. Annette shares the last days of her normal childhood before her life changed. It tells her story in great detail of the day she was scarred for life. Burnt Face is an emotionally moving story about the profound impacts the horrific scars made to her childhood and follows her struggle into adolescence. It's a story of friendships, overcoming bullying, and growing into a strong and rebellious teen in the notorious suburbs of Broadmeadows, known for boisterous youth and gangs during the 70s and 80s. Hi, Annette. First of all, welcome and thank you for coming on Book Talk Radio Club. Thanks for having me, Claire. It's, um, it's great to be on your show. It's really good. Thank you. Why did you decide to write the book, Burnt Face? Um, well, I guess uh, when I moved from Melbourne to Mackay, um, I met a, a lady, a teacher friend of mine, and we used to go walking every morning, mm-hmm. and I would tell her the stories of my life in Melbourne right. and, uh, and when I got burnt, and she used to say to me, you need to write a book. And, um, you know, this went on for about two years, and then eventually I said, you know what, I'm going to write that book. Mm-hmm. And so I started that, but I also... I just wanted to have something for my kids to understand because they've never really asked me about what happened. So I wanted them to have an understanding of, um, you know, my life and and how I got burnt and what I went through. Right. And ultimately I I really wanted to get it out there to inspire um, other children who've been burnt and, you know, let their families know that they play a very important role mm. in uh, in how we become adults and, and you know, we couldn't do it without them and their support. So, you know, that, that's been part of it too. It must have been very painful to write your story or did you find it cathartic? Um, look, although it was really traumatic because I had to get myself right back into that moment and yeah. relive everything um, as that nine-year-old girl. Mm. Um, it was also cathartic because it, it, um, it, it sort of got me through a bit of healing, but not just me, my mother, because mum's always blamed herself um, for what happened, even though it wasn't her fault. Sure. But she was never able to read the book and she'd only get through She got through the first couple of pages and then it was too... Um, too much for her. So when I put my head down to really get into it and get the book out, because mm. it was 10 years into making, you know, a lot of that was procrastinating and and I don't think I was really ready to put myself out there. But once I, I put my head down and gave myself a time frame, I asked mum to be my, my sub-editor before I sent it off to the editor. Right. And she read each chapter as I finished it and um, it was really – good for her because it um it got her to realize that you know I I I admire her for making me the strong and confident person I am today and you know it wasn't her fault that someone poured methylated spirits on a barbecue you know um yeah it just happened did the person ever apologize to you um, no, it, it actually, it happened at my mum's uh, work Christmas barbecue, right. uh, having a social gathering, mm. and it was a, a colleague, a work colleague of my mother, it was her son-in-law, and he um, he poured methylated spirits on the barbecue, <laughs> my brother and I were sitting in front of it, and the flames shot up and exploded the bottle, and he threw the bottle I pushed my brother out the way and I copped the brunt of the explosion. <laughs> um, now, we went to the hospital and, you know, I, I only found out when I was finalising the book that he was actually in the car mm. that took us to the hospital um, because he burned his arm from the explosion. Right. But um, as soon as they transferred me to a children's hospital, uh, we never saw him again and... He never admitted to doing it. 
uh, was my mine and my brother's word against his, and us being nine and eleven, yeah, uh, it wasn't it, it couldn't be held up. Right. And no one at the barbecue admitted to witnessing it. So huh. you know, unbelievable. Mom, yeah, mum basically was um, no one ever contacted her or spoke to her, and you know we've sort of brushed aside. You know, and I, I mean, I know it was an accident. Yeah. And, you know, I'm really, really hoping that through media or other channels or the book itself, I can meet with him to forgive him. I know who it is. I know his name. Yeah. Um, but I really want to be able to meet with him and, and forgive him and, and actually thank him because I, I probably wouldn't have the life that I have now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going through what I did, so, you know. You had a number of surgeries to correct the scarring. When was the last one? Um, the last one was actually only seven years ago in 2010. Oh, right. Um, I left Melbourne in 1991, and just before I left Melbourne, um, I had uh, skin taken from um, my stomach area from hip to hip, two inches wow. thick. Um, by two inches wide, and my neck was literally cut from ear to ear, and they lifted my neck and put the skin in under there to give me more movement. Yeah. Um, and then I left Melbourne. Like I'd ha I had my uh, uh, dermabrasions and everything. It was, it was quite a massive surgery before I left. So for 20 years living up here, I never had any further surgeries, mm. but I always had a bit of a um, – uh, loose skin under my under my chin and jaw. Right. So um, I actually had to have other surgery, and and I said to the plastic surgeon, "Can you do something about this skin?" So that was the last surgery I had relating to the scars. Right. Um, my plastic surgeon in Melbourne. I recently made contact with him after twenty seven years. I sent him a book mm. and. He's quite well known. He was actually um, Dr. Anthony Holmes. He was the surgeon who separated Trishna and Krishna. Right. Uh, they were conjoined twins. Mm. Um, and he's done a lot of work with craniofacial um, in that field of surgery. So he was pioneering a lot of surgeries when, when he took on me at a, as a 15-year-old. Yeah. And... Um, you know, like I was sort of the guinea pig for dermabrasions on, on burn scars because they only used to ever be done on acne scarring. Right. Um, but he was amazing. Like he, yeah, he did a fantastic job. Do you use a special kind of makeup for concealment? No. When I was younger, I mum took me to special places to, and we tried different um, concealing makeup, but they cost a fortune and, and we, you know, we couldn't really afford to maintain that. So mm. um, I actually ended up, Max Factor Pan Stick gave me wonderful coverage. Right. And, um, you know, over the years I've worn makeup all my life. I don't even leave the house without having makeup on my face. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, even as a 52-year-old, not giving away my age, <laughs> but giving it away, um, I'm now using like an Estee Lauder liquid, which is great coverage as well. So, um, no, I, 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 the only concealer I use is what you would normally use for, you know, baggy eyes or whatever. Uh -huh. You say in that quote, inner strength is something that we all have, but we usually don't realise this until we are confronted with something that makes us draw on the strength. At what point did you realise you had this inner strength? Um. Look, I think it was over a course of time. There were there were several things that I had to draw on um, in a strength. And, you know, if I could give you some examples. Sure. Uh, I guess going through the numerous surgeries and physiotherapy sessions, um, you know, you do find the strength to get through all that pain and, mm. and keep going. And, you know, I guess another major time was my first day back at school after I was burnt. Um, mum was advised to send me straight back to school right. so that I would become reclusive. So two weeks after I got out of hospital, I went to school and 
You know, I had bandages, I had a plaster collar, oh. a felt chin strap that wrapped around my head and and um, hair that was above my ears because all my long hair had been burnt off. So, um, And one of my ears was burnt. And um, when I walked into that classroom, and I talk about it in the book, mm. um, you know, I felt like a freak, a monster, and, and you could just tell by the the gasps and the looks and, you know, the nudging and whispering of the other kids, you know, these nine and ten-year-olds. Um, it was it took all the strength I had to just stand there and not race back out the door. I bet. I bet. You know, so bet. those type of things. And then I guess, um, you know, I... In my teens, I was followed home by a group of girls and, and you know, as, as you were saying, we grew up in a rough area in Melbourne, so there was a lot of physical violence and whatnot and, and I actually got followed home by about six girls egging me on to fight with them and, <laughs> and even though I'd already built up the tough skin and I, I had become, you know, a strong person myself, yeah. I ignored them and, and when I got home, I just broke down. I felt like I was weak and, you know, mum actually said to me, it, it takes a strong person to ignore it. Absolutely. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things over the years that have made me draw on inner strength and and when you look back at it, and, and as I said, it's cathartic writing about it because you realise you have these little epiphanies about, gee, you know, I got through that. And as an adult, going back to that child, you think, my God, how did you get through that? You suffered much bullying and teasing but overcame it to grow up into a rebellious teenager. How did you rebel in it? Um, well, I mean, you know, as a child I was taunted with the name Burnt Face and, and that's how why I named the book that because I, I actually took ownership of it. Mm. Um, so I rebelled against the bullies that were trying to make me cower and and I guess, um, you know, I stood up to them which made me stronger and more confident mm. um, and even in high school, you know, even with the boys, I, I had a, I was sort of the one that looked after the, the, um, the kids that weren't strong or confident and, you know, the nerdy, I guess you could say the nerdy type of kids I'd put under my wing mm. and um, there was a, a a small Italian boy who was being bullied by a, a tall, you know, big kid. And um, he contacted me on Facebook when Facebook first came into play and, and he said, I never forgot you, Annette. You actually went up and, um, you know, basically told off this bully and said to him, don't you touch him again and really blah, blah, blah. And, and um, Charlie, the, uh, the, the Italian boy, said to me, he never came near me again, you know, and he never forgot that. But even, you know, even as teenagers, um, from the age of 12, we were hanging out with um, a group of boys in gangs and, you know, smoking cigarettes and drinking and crashing parties. And, and then obviously where there's parties and alcohol, there was fighting and, um, you know, so I guess I, I kind of rebelled against being bullied and in a sense became one but not in you know not in the sense that I taunted people mm. just <clears throat> became um, aggressive I guess so yeah. that it, it covered my insecurities well sure it was a form of defense yeah exactly yeah. As, as kids we tend to want to fit in with our peers it must have been extremely hard for you what would you say to your younger self now um I've been asked this before and, and, you know, hindsight, isn't it wonderful? Um, look, I guess all of my, my friends had boyfriends. It was the era when, you know, teens were all boyfriends and girlfriends and I was always the friend, you know. Yeah. I like you too much as a friend and and I used to always think, you know, I wish I had a boyfriend. Is it ever going to happen? No one will like me because of my scars and... And so I guess what I'd say to my younger self is you are perfect the way you are. Um, give yourself time to learn to love you. Yeah. And then 
once you really and truly love yourself, you can be loved. Absolutely. And, you know, it's so important. And, and for me, like my husband's my rock. He's, I, I adore him and, and hmm. he sort of sits in the background and lets me do this sort of stuff and, you know, doesn't get in there. And, and I mean, he's, he's like my rock. So I didn't meet him until I was 27. Right. And, you know, I didn't realise what truly loving someone and being loved was until then. Oh. One kiss on New Year's and, Eve changed your world. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, we, we sort of knocked around with a group of boys and, and myself and a couple of my friends were sitting on our lawn um, just before New Year. Mm. And a car pulled up. Uh, a ute and two of the guys we knew were in the ute and there was another guy in there and I'd never seen him before and um, he was quite cheeky and um, had tattoos on him and I sort of said to my friend, who's that? And she said, oh, that's Mark. And he used to know her sister Mm. and um, the guys were like, come on, jump in, we're going for a drive And, and we went to get in the car and my older brother came out and he's like, get inside or I'm going to go and tell, you know, mum when she gets home. So I didn't go with them. <laughs> right. But apparently, you know, when they were driving around, he'd been asking about, you know, me and what happened and sure. and my friend decided to invite him to our New Year's party. So um, I remember when he walked in and I, I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't really thinking of anything. And then um, New Year came and... And the girl said, uh, there's someone at the front door for you. And Mm. when you walked into our house, uh, there were three doors. The left side was the lounge room. In front of you was the kitchen and to the right was my mother's bedroom. Mm -hmm. And if you shut up the doors, it was like you were in a little square alcove. (laughs) Um, So I went to go to the front door and, and all of the doors shut and it was like, oh, and then Mark walked in and, and, um, said Happy New Year and, and gave me a kiss and it was my first kiss and and it's funny when I talk about it in the book because it's, it, it still sort of spins me out now that it was so unexpected. Uh-huh. Um, but I guess what, what really changed my life was that was probably the moment that I thought, you know, I am like everybody else. Yeah. You know, if someone is wanting to kiss me and... And, you know, he asked me to be his girlfriend and it was like, wow, it was just so mind-blowing that it happened like that. And I guess from that moment on, um, I realised some people just don't care about um, looks aren't always everything and so what, I had some scars and that was his attitude, you know. I don't don't care what anyone else thinks. Mm. So, yeah, it it was life-changing. Where can Book Talk Radio Club listeners purchase Burnt Face? Um, they can purchase print copies on my website, which is www.annettswan.com um, forward slash burnt face. And there's also links to uh, the Amazon, um, both Australia and, and um, Amazon.com. Right. That's lovely. Thank you, Annette. That was fascinating. And thank you so much for talking to us about your book and your experience. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio Club. Thanks, Annette. You have a lovely day. You too. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.